good morning, 9 o'clock on Daylight Savings Time. You get an extra jewel in your crown, everyone. Let's go. And if you are a parent here and you got kids up, we'll just give you a crown in the back. That's our gift to you as you leave today. Hey, I am uh, so grateful that you all are here this morning. Uh, if we haven't gotten a chance to meet, my name is Hunter Melton, and I get the pleasure and the honor of working with college students and with young professionals and with our groups here at the church. Uh, our pastor, who's getting some uh, well-deserved uh, rest and relaxation uh, this morning, sends his greetings to you as well. If you have a Bible, I'm going to invite you to open them up this morning to John chapter 9. If you've been with us, you know that we are in the middle of a sermon series, uh, kind of going along with the capital campaign that Bill just talked about called Pursue. And I love the idea of pursue uh, because this idea of our relationship with Jesus, it's all about his pursuit of us. Now, I don't know about you, but in the middle of a, uh, a capital campaign where there's so many good things happening, uh, in the middle of a city where there's so many people moving in and out, where there's uh, anxieties about housing and all those kinds of things, in the middle of a world that seemingly can't get out of um, turmoil, sometimes what we need most when we come to spaces like this is not another thing to do, but is to come here and to take a deep breath and to know the kindness and the intimacy and the love that Jesus has for each of us. Like the thing that calms a weary soul is not another proactive thing. It's a it's a settling into what has already been done for us. And maybe you're here today, and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. And I would say this, we are so glad that you are here. Because the church is made up of people who don't have their lives together, acting a certain way. We're made up of people who have been found. And so we open up our arms wide to you, brother or sister. Because Jesus opened up his arms wide to us. So today in John 9, we're going to read about Jesus performing a miracle. On the, on the surface level, it's about Jesus healing and opening up the eyes of a man who was born blind. But really, right, it's not just about 2,000 years ago about a man whose eyes uh, were not opened. Really today, what we are going to see is a picture of how Jesus wants to open our eyes. How he wants to open yours. And so for salvation, he opens our eyes. But even if you have been a believer for many years, Jesus is wanting to open your eyes to see the world how he would and how he does. And so today, in John 9, 1 through 12, we're going to see that in action, and then we're going to live that out. All right? So I'm going to invite, with you, or invite you today to stand with me as we read from John 9, 1 through 12, healing a man born blind. As he, Jesus, was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man or his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work as long as I am in the world. I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from saliva, and spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he left, washed, and came back seeing. His neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said, He's the one. Others were saying, No, but he looks like him. He kept saying, I'm the one. So they asked him, And how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and told me to go to Salome and wash. So when I went and washed, I received my sight. Where is he, they asked. I don't know, he said. Okay, let's pray together and invite Jesus into this space. 
Heavenly Father, we are uh, desperate to see things, to see this world how you have and how you do. There's so many things that want to catch our vision, that want to catch our attention in this world. And yet you, Lord, are the only one that has the words of eternal life. So open our ears this morning to hear. Open our eyes to see. Open our hearts to perceive. And Jesus, do a miracle in this room today. Like, do what only you can do. We are serious about meeting with you, about dwelling with you, about communing with you. So we're your people. We fought a daylight savings time. We fought cold weather. And we're here to meet with you. So, Lord, uh, speak. Your servants are listening. It's your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, keep your Bibles open because we're going to go back to those quite frequently. All right, so let's, uh, let's get started. We've got a lot of work to do. So uh, John 9, we're going to kind of start in verse 1. But if you want to look a couple of verses before that, if you have your Bible, right before our story today, Jesus has just come from the temple. And I love this about Jesus. He, is, uh, he, he just tells it how it is. Um, he, he tells the Pharisees, after kind of giving a, a, a proclamation about who he was, he kind of laid the, the hammer down, and he says this. Uh, he, he, they said, hey, you know, Abraham is our father, and uh, you're only like 30 years old, so how are you wiser than our father who lived thousands of years ago? And I love what he said. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. It's fascinating. If Jesus was just like a lunatic... And as a 30-year-old, he was saying that, like, I existed before Abraham. He would have said, before Abraham was, I was, right? Before Abraham existed, I existed. But he's making a statement about his deity there. In that moment, Jesus was equating himself with God, who told Moses in Exodus 3, 14, at the burning bush, tell them, the Egyptians, I am who I am sent you. So, in that moment, right, if you're ever wondering, why in the world? Jesus is a peaceful carpenter. Why in the world are they always trying to persecute Jesus? It's because he was constantly equating himself with God. Like he was constantly saying, do you not see it? I am the one that you are searching scriptures to see. Like that is me. Like I am Jesus. And the Pharisees just couldn't see that. It's crazy. So Jesus, like they pick up stones to try to stone him. And he miraculously, he does what Jesus does. I don't know, walks through walls, right? Quickly leaves. So he leaves the temple. And, and this is fascinating. Verse 1. If you're just reading, you might blow past this. But I love in verse 1. As he was passing by. You could fill a book with that phrase right there. As he was passing by. I love that Jesus was never in a hurry. The guy literally just went from the Pharisees trying to stone him, miraculously popping out of the temple, and he's walking on the streets. And what does Jesus notice? Someone to the side. Now, this is not in my notes. Like This is just for free, right? So you, you got this for free. Friends, Margin in your calendar is actually a spiritual discipline because it's in the margin where the goods are seen. It's in the margin when we slow and we're rested that we're actually able to see things the way that Jesus does. Um, maybe I could say this. Productivity is not always a Christian virtue because we are working towards a different goal. I love that Jesus is just Walking, You know, you never see a picture of Jesus just running. The only time you see a picture of God running was when uh, the story of the prodigal son, where the father who represented God ran to save his son. That's the only time you see God in a hurry. And so Jesus, even after he has death threats, is just passing by. And what does he see? A man. Maybe a reflective question is, is your schedule so packed that you would miss an opportunity to bless someone else. So Jesus here, he sees this man, and he just got done announcing his, temp uh, his deity. He announced his deity in the temple, but he's about to display it on the streets. Now, what's interesting is that a rabbi of this nature, Jesus was by everyone's account a Jewish rabbi. 
A Jewish rabbi had a certain status in life. They didn't talk to certain people, right? And so a blind man would have been in that custom, uh, someone would have been born blind because of someone's sin. The Pharisees ask, or the disciples ask, I mean, that's a very common Jewish teaching. Well, Jesus, who sinned? Was it this man? Did he sin or did his parents sin? Like, we've got to find someone to blame here. And so Jesus going towards the blind man would have been inconceivable because in a Jewish world, sin was almost like contagious, Like you could almost catch sin from someone else. And so you always wanted to keep away from the unclean people. But Jesus here, he flips the Jewish law and maybe our own law that we have in our hearts where the touch of an unclean person would make a ceremoniously clean person unclean. Now Jesus is the cleanest by Jewish law standard. He's the cleanest person of all time. He's never had a need to go and sacrifice at the temple. He's never had a need to say, I'm sorry. He's never had a need to be like, yo, I messed up on that. I shouldn't have said it. He's never said a bad word when he stumped his toe. I don't know what Jesus said when he said that, but he never sinned. He is the most clean person to ever live. And what does he do? He still moves towards this man. He heals this man. The the clean person person, his touch made the unclean person clean. And that's what I love like about our faith. You know, a lot of times people will try to make these grand statements when they're trying to disprove Christianity. They're like, hey, look, you know, okay, Christianity, it's one of many, it's one of many religions. And the answer should be like, well, no, duh. Right? Like, that's an obvious statement. And what they're trying to do there, right, is they're trying to kind of devalue the uniqueness of our faith. And what I would say to this, and even if you're someone here today who's exploring the claims of Christianity, I love this. We see in this story a picture of a Savior who is so unique, and he is so otherworldly. Friends, hear me out when I say this. No other faith narrative, no other faith story is saying that the Creator became like the created so that the created could be with the creator. What I'm getting here is this, is every other faith models the way that our world, models the pattern of our world by saying you cut and you climb your way to the top. And Jesus is just saying, I myself was cut so that you could be with me. And maybe we just need to be reminded of that. That the best thing that you can do is not to do something for Jesus, but to revel in his goodness for you, right? Our faith story is not about primarily about our pursuit of God. It's about God's pursuit of us. Now, I don't think anybody here who's been in church very long is like super surprised by that statement. But sometimes people don't need to be taught something new. They just need to be reminded of it, what you already know. So in John 9, this man who had been born, who was born blind, been blind his entire life, was about to find himself in the middle of Jesus' grand redemption plan. Right In verse 3, Jesus says this, this man's blindness came about not because of sin, but that God's works might be displayed in him. Here's another side note. If you are walking through something hard right now, and you are grieving something, and you are wanting Jesus to come and to make the wrong things right, his promise is that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So the things that are hard in your life right now, friends, I promise in due time, God will redeem this, and he, his works will be displayed in you, and his glory will be revealed. But it had always been a sign, for this man in particular, it had always been a sign of the messianic age when the Messiah would come that the blind will receive their sight. It's interesting, if you look, go back and you look at the Old Testament, that there had never been, uh, never was a, a miracle of somebody receiving sight in the Old Testament. That miracle just does not exist. It's because this miracle belonged to Jesus only. That's why it's shocking that the Pharisees didn't see that as like a sign in the Messianic age because they knew the Old Testament so much. In the book of Isaiah, there was a prophecy about what it would be like when the Messiah would come and what that age would look like. In Isaiah 29, 18, in that day the deaf shall hear, by the way, Jesus opened uh, the deaf ears, 
They, they will hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. Friends, this was pointing to this moment. I love that the Bible is one story tied together, pointing to one man, Jesus. And what Jesus is doing here is more than giving sight to a blind man. He is showing that the Messiah is coming to give sight to all people, even you, even me. Eyes to see what we were made for. Eyes to behold our creator. Eyes to see that this world isn't enough to satisfy our longings. Eyes to see our desperate need for true healing. Uh, I was hiking with some of our, uh, our young professionals uh, last weekend, and we were sitting at a waterfall pondering the deep things of the Lord, because that's just what you do at a waterfall. And, uh, and there was this gentleman who came up uh, to us, and he just was, uh, was very interested in what we were doing. We had our Bibles out in the middle of like a, you know, like a park. It was kind of an odd thing. He's like, are you guys doing like a book study or whatever? And I was like, yeah, kind of, man. Like, we're talking about our faith. And so we got to talking about it. He was a, a, an agnostic who would say that he's spiritual. And, and I could tell that he found a lot of his achievement in work. And um, I, said, I said, hey, you know, uh, a guy named C.S. Lewis said, um, that if you find in your heart that uh, nothing of this world can satisfy its longings, that that's evidence that you were made for another world. And he like looked at me and his response was, oh, that's deep. Like that's the only thing that he could say. I was like, okay, well maybe that was too much right there. But you know what? <laughs> Sitting in a waterfall, okay, you know what, buddy? That's, yeah, that's right. Love you, bro. Here's my number. We'll talk, right? So... <laughs> But that's what Jesus is saying, is he's like saying, look, if your eyes are not open to the spiritual realm, to where Jesus has for you, to the cross, you're always going to be a little bit unsatisfied. You're always going to be walking around like you are seeing, but you don't see. Like you're, you're perceiving, but you don't perceive. And it's because this dimension is actually not what you were made for. Your world was, this world here is not your home, it's a house, and your home is with the Lord. And Jesus opens our eyes to see that. And once you see it, my goodness, right? The song, uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonder, glorious face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You see, friends, our eyes need to be opened daily. Daily to see the world how Jesus sees it. But our boy here, he's sitting here, he's blind, and what does Jesus do to heal this man? He bends down and he makes mud, and this is weird, makes mud from his spit. You're like, okay, Jesus, I was with you then. You were, you know, you were claiming to be God. I get with that. Like, then all of a sudden, you, you spit into mud and you kind of roll it around, which, by the way, it was illegal to roll mud on the Sabbath day. That's just, a, you know, for your edification there. And so he rolls the mud up, and he puts it on the guy's eyes. And he doesn't put it on his eyeballs. He puts it on his eyelids. But still, really odd that Jesus makes mud out of his spit. And, and we don't really know why Jesus was doing this. But it's interesting here that Jesus, to heal this man, gave some of himself to heal him. For us, he gives all of himself to heal us. Jesus doesn't send a proxy. He doesn't send a substitute. He sends himself. So in verse 7, right, if you're following along with this, in verse 7, what does Jesus do? He says, go, uh, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent, because Jesus was the sent one. And so the man goes and he washes in the pool of Siloam. And what does he do? Surprise, surprise, he comes back seeing. And what must have this been, what must have this been like? Man, crazy. We wouldn't even have a concept for color, right? You guys, guys, look, mud is, I guess it's brown. That's what you guys have been saying, right? The most fascinating thing to a man whose eyes have been open is just to notice the world around him. And so now this man is like seeing everything. And everybody's like, whoa, this is uh, different. We're used to not, this man just kind of being seated uh, because he can't see. Nobody's going to lead him around. And so because he was healed on the Sabbath day, because Jesus rolled mud and made, you know, this is big, big breaking of the law here. The, the townspeople take notice. And what do they do? Well, they're like knowing that the Pharisees, the Pharisees are kind of like, hey, this is, man, 
uh, you got to keep the law, and the townspeople knew that. And so they brought Jesus, and this is what we haven't read, kind of summarizing the story. They brought Jesus to the Pharisees for questioning. Some of the Pharisees thought, how can a man from God break the Sabbath? By the way, Jesus said later on that uh, Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for Sabbath, meaning man was not meant to just keep Sabbath. Sabbath is actually a tool for you, right? Others thought, uh, I don't know, how can a sinful man heal someone? Like that seems really out of line with what we would think a sinful man could do. And so they questioned the man, and after not getting what they wanted from him, they dismissed him, uh, and then they brought in his parents. I love this, right? Like they bring in his parents. They're like, hey, y'all, you've seen him from birth. What's going on here? And the parents, were, they threw it right back on the kid, man. There ain't no, like, you know, they were terrified. And they said, I don't know. Ask him, right? He's of age. We don't want any part of it. Ask him. Man, if I'm doing that to my son later on in life, just throwing him under the bus, somebody need to heart check me, man, because that's not right. But the Pharisees brought the man back in a second time. And here's the goods. Here's where we can lean in real quick. And this is how the conversation went down in verses 24 through 25, which you can go back and read this week. Uh, the Pharisees start off like this. They said, give glory to God, right? My goodness, is this not a, uh, just a good example of how you can think you know the Lord and you don't know the Lord? Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. And I love what the man's response is here. Whether or not he is a sinner, I don't know. But one thing I do know. I was blind, and now I see. And you're thinking, that, man, that guy ripped off a line from a song. Like, he stole that song. I'm, no, that's not. That's it right there. If you were nothing else, that's it. This man knew almost nothing about Jesus theologically. He knew nothing. The man called Jesus. He didn't even know if he was a sinner or not. He's not. We know that. He'd never read Master Plan of Evangelism. He had never uh, attended a church before. All he knew was that he was once blind, and now he sees. I think we overcomplicate the Christian life. You know, for me, uh, I know absolutely nothing about cars. Anybody here a car person? Okay, nobody. Great. Okay, so um, I don't know anything about cars. I went to buy a car one time uh, at uh, Crest uh, Honda down the way, and the guy said, hey, you like want to go look at a car? And I was like, sure, let's go. And he said, you want to look at the hood, under the hood? And I just thought that maybe I should say yes, right? I have no, I'm like, sure, ma'am, get, get, pop the hood. Let's look underneath it. And so he pops the hood, and I just remember looking at it and being like, Cool, man. That thing got a Hemi? I don't know. Like, what? I don't know what this I'm supposed to say here that makes me sound like I know what I'm saying. Uh, but I have no idea. But every time I get in that car, I believe that my car works. Why? Because it turns on and then I start driving it, meaning that I believe it will carry me from point A to point B. Too many of us feel like that before we proclaim our faith in Jesus, certainly to other people, that we've got to get super lapsarianism, dissertation, all these fancy words that kind of sound like maybe they're pseudo Starbucks orders, right? Like, we feel like we got to get all that figured out. And this man right here is like, look, I once was blind, but now I see. I don't know what else to say. And I just wonder if so many of us are, like, fearful of, like, proclaiming our faith because we don't know what we were saved from. Right? I got saved at the age of nine. You know, before that, I, you know, was an axe murderer, and I did all these crazy things, and went to attend vacation Bible school one day, and the Lord saved me, glory, I met. I don't know, right? But I just wonder if we don't know what we were saved from, which means that it's hard for us to proclaim what other people can be saved from. And this man just shows it right here. Look, dude, I don't know what else to say to you guys. I once was blind, but now I see. I love in Revelation, um, it, it says uh, that we overcome Satan and his schemes by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That that's the power that we have given in this world. Friend, everything that you have to overcome in this life is already inside of you. It's Jesus Christ and his blood applied from the death on the cross. And it's your story. 
And in the hard moments and in the moments where it's tough and you don't know what else to say, what you can say is, I don't know what else to do, but I once was blind and now I see. I once was without hope and now I have hope. I once had no plan in life and now I have the, the best plan, the only plan that will bring me salvation. Friends, that's it. And my question for you, and this is meant to be very like much so a reflective question to carry with you. Like, what has Jesus done for you? And what is Jesus doing in you right now? And and I want to push back like very uh, tenderly on this. If you can't answer those questions, I want to plead for you to consider if you have truly put your trust in Jesus or not. It is an unkind thing for us to think that church attendance or history, chronological history inside of a church uh, equates to salvation because these Pharisees knew it better than all of us. Have you put your trust in Jesus? Because if not, the Bible would tell us that your eyes are still not opened that you might see, but there is far more to see. In verse 35, um, and that kind of wraps up the story. In verse 35, the man has been put out of the temple because the Pharisees just didn't know what to do with him. And Jesus had heard that this man had been kicked out and he went and found him. And so uh, when Jesus found him, this is what he asked him. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Like, do you believe? Do you believe in Son of Man was a very famous uh, or very commonly used term. It started in Daniel to describe the coming Messiah, and it was applied to Jesus in the New Testament. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And this is what the guy said. I love it. It's just so pure. It's just so like, of yes. The man says, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus says, I am he. Just says, I am he. And I love what the guy says. I believe, Lord. I believe. And what did he do next? He worshiped him. Um, friends, Jesus' death on the cross has purchased your salvation. But that comes through faith. That comes by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. What this man just did right here, he confessed it, I believe, and then we know that he believed it in his heart because he got down and he worshiped him. This is what it means to be a Christian. It is no nothing about behavior modification. It's nothing about cleaning yourself up in order to meet Jesus. Man, it is about the fact that Jesus comes to us in the middle of our brokenness and he says, I died for you before you even knew to look to me. And all of life, we are asking ourselves, Lord, or world, where is salvation? And Jesus is saying, it is right here, centered in me. And so Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, so maybe that, maybe you can already say, I believe in my heart, and I have confessed with my mouth. Good. Who do you know that has not put their trust in Jesus? All you have to do is you have to say, hey, look, man, I don't know about all the particularities and the, all these sort of, you know, schemes of uh, religion, but all I know is that I once was blind, but now I see. And if you are here today and you don't know Jesus, you are uh, not here by accident. You are here on a day where the gospel is being proclaimed for you to hear, for you to see, for you to believe. And so we would ask this, that all you have to do is to admit that you are a sinner, to believe that Jesus Christ came to die for your sins, and that he, when he died, he rose again, and that he was resurrected, and then eventually he ascended to be with the Lord, and that you just confess with your mouth that you need Jesus. That's all that you have to do. So my question, my prayer for us today as we wrap kind of this up is, friends, 
Are your eyes opened? Not just for salvation, but to see the ones around you that Jesus has seen all along. I've heard that really the, the idea of discipleship is knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, and then doing what he would do if he were in your shoes. What would Jesus do if he lived your life now? And how would he act? And if you don't know Jesus, I'm inviting you today to put your trust in him. So um, if that's you, I would ask after the service, myself and a few other people are going to be down front, and we would love to talk with you. You can also uh, reach out to the church in the middle of the week. We know that sometimes coming up front uh, at a church, even if it's after a service, is a scary thing. But we are serious friends that we exist to see Jesus in hearts of all over the city of Nashville. And today could be your day.